Uh, good morning. I'm Dave Bonoff. I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I do quite a bit of post-frame building research there. Today I'm going to talk about a Post and Pure Foundation design aid that I developed. In 2017, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, or ASAB, released the third revision, which would be the fourth version of its standard on shallow post foundation design. Both the third and fourth versions of the standard carry the title of shallow post and pier foundation design. Commencing with that uh, third version of the standard were entirely new methods for determining the ability of soil to resist bearing loads, lateral loads, and uplift loads. So I just want to be clear on this. The standard is really all about the ability of soil and backfill surrounding the foundation to resist the loads that are applied to without failing. The standard does have provisions that help you determine how the loads in a post or pier itself change with depth, but it does not have checks, design checks, to make sure that the post and pier foundation materials themselves will not fail. That is something that you need to do using other design specifications. For example, if you had an embedded wood post, you would use the national design specifications for wood construction to determine if that post, uh, wood post, was um, sufficient to meet the loads applied to it. This is an outline of the current standard. It contains 14 clauses. The primary objective of this design aid is to help designers complete the calculations in clauses 10, 11, and 12, which are titled Bearing Strength Assessment, Lateral Strength Assessment, and Uplift Strength Assessment. Again, these strength assessments are soil strength assessments. Nevertheless, some of these calculations can get, can get quite involved, and not surprisingly, several folks uh, have asked me if a computer-based program could be developed to help assist with the calculations. In response to this request, I developed an Excel workbook. And just so we're using the same terminology, an Excel workbook is a collection of worksheets, also known as spreadsheets, for Microsoft Excel, uh, which itself is a computer program. Uh, development of an Excel work book instead of a specialized applications program was done so that you as individuals or companies can easily modify its contents to fit your needs. And this includes, for example, dropping individual worksheets and other workbooks that you're using in building design, you know, formatting some of these worksheets uh, for enhanced display or printing, and that could include maybe adding your company logo into them, and, you know, anything else you might want to do. Another reason for going the workbook route is that workbooks for popular spreadsheet programs like Microsoft Excel have a longer average life than a special applications program. And yeah, Excel itself is a special applications program, but it's a program that is continually updated. And that's it's always pretty much going to be available, at least in my lifetime, for running the workbook that I'm covering today. One other thing before I move on here to details of the workbook. You know, let me just say that if you decide to modify any portion of the workbook for your own use, uh, it'd be wise to save an original version that can be used to check if fundamental calculations were corrupted uh, during your modification of the content. The workbook that was developed contains seven worksheets with titles shown here. We're going to go over each of these uh, worksheets one by one. As you see, the first worksheet is titled Introduction. And it contains the table shown here on this very slide, as well as the table that I previously showed you that lists the 14 clauses in the standard itself. This is, this, I guess, and the next two slides are really screenshots of the introduction worksheet. The first uh, section in the entire uh, worksheet is titled uh, This Workbook, and it just explains the workbook. The second section, as you see there, is uh, one that helps you identify the colors that are used in the workbook, and it's probably the most important uh, little table in this introduction worksheet. I'm just going to run down through uh, the colors there. Whenever you see a blue color or blue cell, that's going to have a column heading in it. If you see a green cell, that will contain a unit. Yellow cells are perhaps the most important as they are the ones that require input from you, the user. 
orange cells contain calculated values and they're going to change as you input values into the yellow cells. The red cells contain alerts and for example they're going to tell you whether or not you meet or don't meet a particular design requirement. And the white cells they simply contain fixed values and basic information. The introduction worksheet also contains the purpose, the scope, and the limitations of the ASAB standard as it's given in the standard or as they are listed in the standards and shown here. The last portion of the introduction worksheet covers workbook limitations as well as information on how to obtain the ASAB paper that serves as a user manual for the workbook and which is the paper that many of you are holding on to that you picked up when you came in today. Uh, not shown but also on the worksheet is the link to the ASAB technical library uh, where users can download a copy of the standard itself. And this let me point that if you're an AS point out that if you're an ASAB member, you can typically download that standard for nothing. At least you can download a certain number of standards every year at no cost. Uh, if you're a non-member, you're going to have to pay. And you know, I would hope that that doesn't upset you because you need to understand that the standards activity that ASAB does needs to be financially supported and it's income from the sale of the standards that support that work and therefore helps support the development of the standard that underlies this workbook. One other thing I should also point out is that the document that you picked up, the user manual that you picked up on the way in here will be available on the NFBA website. I, I've been told I guess it's on there already uh, along with the workbook itself and a paper that I wrote that explains the lateral strength and stiffness requirements of the new standard. The second worksheet is titled Definitions and Nomenclature and it contains all definitions and variable descriptions from the standard along with figures 1 through 5 of the standard. This screenshot shows some of the definitions for foundation types and components. This screenshot gives you some more definitions from the worksheet, specifically those covering foundation geometry and constraints and material properties and characteristics. This screenshot just shows uh, some of the variables and constants listed in the worksheet. There's certainly a lot more than you see here. And then this screenshot is just two of the uh, five figures that are shown in the worksheet. There are other figures, by the way, in the standard but they are not in this particular worksheet. The soil profile worksheet is the first worksheet that must be completed by the user. It contains soil profile information that is used by the strength assessment worksheets, and mostly by the lateral strength assessment worksheets. There are actually four tables in this particular soil profile worksheet but only two of them require user input. This is the first table and it has the same title as the worksheet. This is the other table in the soil profile worksheet that requires user input. It has a relatively long title which we will come back to in a bit. Prior to entering data in this and the previous table, you need to have soil profile characteristics. There are a variety of ways to obtain this information and the method that you use largely depends on the importance, at least from a life safety perspective, of the foundation. For commercial and industrial building foundations, an engineer may require an extensive investigation involving standard in situ and laboratory soil tests. For an agricultural building foundation, I've been told it is common for engineers to rely on information from the USDA NRCS web soil survey and after verifying the soil profile with an on-site visual examination. I was not aware of the USDA NRCS website until Aaron Holberg, who's sitting in the front row here, uh, told me about it about two years ago. Because of the value of the web soil survey to the establishment of soil profile characteristics, I'm going to step through an example of its use. So uh, here's step one. 
simply access the website via the link given there on the lower left. The screen you see here should appear, and that's a shot of the contiguous United States. Next, you use the tools located above the map to zoom in on the site that contains your area of interest, which is abbreviated AOI, area of interest. You then click on one of the AOI icons, which are on the right end of the toolbar just above the map, and outline your building. And you can see an outline of the building that has already been created on this particular shot. That is the rectangular hatched area down on the lower right. You can also enter a name, as you see there over on the left of that area of interest. And that would show up in your reports later on. The third step is to click on the Soil Data Explorer tab, which is the middle tab of the five that are listed on the top there. And when you do that, it's going to bring up the next set of tabs located right below it. And you want to click on the fifth and last tab, which is titled Soil Reports. And that's going to bring up the menu that you see on the left, which is titled Soil Reports. The fourth step is to go to that drop-down menu that we just showed on the previous slide, and I've shown it again here on the left. And what you're going to do is to click on Soil Physical Properties, which is uh, a little over halfway down, and then click on Engineering Properties, and then click on View Soils Report. And that's going to bring up an Engineering Properties Report. And then you're going to come back and on that same menu, instead of clicking on engineering properties, you will instead click on physical soils properties, as you see highlighted on the right. And again, you will click then on view soils report, and that will bring up a physical properties report. This is the engineering properties report for the area of interest that I identified. And I just would point out that that particular area of interest is for a current building site on which we are trying out um, some new construction procedures and new post frame building elements. This report gives you a complete soil profile, at least uh, from the soil surface down to a depth of 79 inches if you look in the fourth column there which is titled depth and the sixth column actually has the unified soil classification category something that is important uh, for our use and the far right columns provide the liquid limit and the plasticity index this is the physical soil properties report and among other things, you'll see that it gives moist bulk density, and that is definitely one of the properties that we will need to input in our soils profile worksheet. Once you have soil property information, go to the soil profile worksheet and enter it in the soil profile table, which is shown here. This table was set up to enable users to enter information for up to seven different soil layers, and they're numbered there on the left side in column A. Now note here, when I'm going to refer to column numbers, I'm referring to typical spreadsheet column numbers, which are listed across the top of your spreadsheet, and of course you have row numbers listed down the left side of your spreadsheet. The soil profile is established by first entering into column C the distance from the surface to the bottom of each soil layer. When this is done, the distance to the top of the soil layer is automatically populated in column B. It's important to note that the soil profile must be described to a depth below the surface that is equal to the foundation depth plus 1.5 times the footing width or diameter. Now I realize that at this point, the user is unlikely to have defined neither the footing depth nor the footing width, and that's fine. 
Okay, you just need to make sure that you're going to input soil profile information to that depth. And most people know approximately where they're going to be. So just go with your best maximum estimate. The average moist unit weight of soil in each layer is entered in column D, and this is followed by entry of properties that will be used to calculate lateral soil strength. Now, there are three options that are available for entry of that lateral soil strength information, and we've numbered them options one, two, and three. If lateral soil resistance was determined directly by in situ tests as outlined in the ASAB standard, then just input those values directly into column H, which is identified as option three. Alternatively, use option one for a drained soil and option two for an undrained soil. In general, cohesionless soils, those are soils that are predominantly sands and gravels, are assumed to be drained. And cohesive soils, and those are ones that are predominantly silts and clays, are assumed to be undrained when determining lateral soil resistance and other soil strength properties. A given soil profile will frequently contain both cohesive and cohesionless soils, and that happens to be the case for the area of interest that we are using in our example problem. If you look here, you'll see that underneath the topsoil, below the top 5 to 8 inches, is a clay layer that extends 22 inches below the surface. This cohesive soil is identified as a CL or a CH soil with a plasticity index around 25. Below this clay layer is a cohesionless soil layer that we identified during an on-site inspection to be a silty sand, which is identified SM. For construction purposes, the top 22 inches of soil were removed and replaced by 24 inches of road gravel conforming to ASTM D1241 requirements for a gradation C material. This road gravel was classified as a GW soil. Replacing cohesive soils with non-cohesive soil should be done anytime the cohesive soil falls under the classification of an expansive soil. And the ASAB standard states that a soil with an expansive index greater than 20 is considered to be expansive and should be avoided. And, and the standard fur further states that a soil is also considered expansive if it has a plasticity index that's a PI of 15 or greater and 10% or more of its particles are less than five, 5 micrometers in size. Again, that's less than 5 micrometers in size. So, with our soil replacement, the soil profile table appears as shown here. The drain friction angle did not come from the previous displayed reports, but from the table of presumptive soil properties in the ASAB standard. Here is that table. It's one of the four tables in the soil, soil profile worksheet. It's located just to the right of the soil profile table in the worksheet. I know it's hard to make out numbers, but suffice it to say that if you know the unified soil classification category and the moist unit weight for your soil, you can get the drain soil friction angle from this table. If you look at that column, which is the sixth column over, there are no friction angles listed for cohesive soils, and those would be the four top categories or soil types on the left. Those are only for your coarse grain soils, your predominantly sand and gravel soils. Three other pieces of information that must be entered into the soil profile worksheet are entered in the table with the long title shown here. These three bits of information are the depth of the water table, the width of the foundation near grade, and which of the three options, one, two, or three, uh, you're going to be using to calculate out the ultimate lateral soil resistance. So just a couple comments here. With res first of all, with respect to the depth of the water table, make sure you input a realistic value. That's very important, important because it can be used or it is used in calculation of strength properties uh, in all cases for bearing lateral and uplift resistance. The uh, width of the foundation grade influences the lateral soil resistance near the soil surface for cohesive soils. And I would tell you then once the data 
is complete. You filled in the three values in this table and in the previous soil profile table. The fourth table in a worksheet is automatically populated. And that table is shown here. It's titled Soil Properties for One Inch Thick Layers. The values in this table are used in a lateral strength assessment U worksheet, which we will get to in a bit. I'll briefly explain what's in this table, but as fast as I'm probably doing it, I would not expect anyone, including myself, to fully comprehend it. The first three columns are never change. The fourth column, uh, column D, contains the moist unit weights, which are used to calculate the total vertical stress values in column E. Total ver vertical stress values are used along with depth to the ground water table to calculate the effective vertical stress values in column F. The next four columns, G, H, I, and J, contain drained soil friction angle, drain cohesion, undrained soil shear strength, and ultimate lateral resistance from in situ tests, respectively. Now, note here, two or three of these four columns will contain zero values, with the exact number of zero populated columns dependent upon which of those three options, one, two, or three, you selected for calculating ultimate lateral soil resistance. Columns K and L are columns H and I, respectively, with a depth adjustment applied to all the values within four times the foundation width of the soil surface. These adjustments account for the greater lack of soil confinement near the soil surface. Column M contains coefficients of passive earth pressure, values that are solely a function of drain soil friction angle. And the last column in this table, column N, contains the ultimate lateral soil resistance value for each of the soil layers. Now we're going to move on to the next worksheet, which is the bearing strength assessment worksheet. This worksheet is used to determine if the downward force acting on a round or square footing exceeds the allowable limits as dictated by soil strength. There are three tables in this worksheet, and the first one is shown here. It carries the same title as the worksheet, and it has seven yellow cells. The first yellow cell is in row 5, and that is where footing size is entered. That's the diameter for a round footing and side length of a square footing. In row 6, the distance from the surface to the underside of the footing is entered. Next, if you have an LRFD loading, you enter it in row 7, and you place a 0 in row 8 for the ASD loading. Alternatively, if you have an ASD loading, you enter it in row 8 and place a 0 in row 7. In row 9, you identify the shape of the footing. If you enter a 0, the worksheet's going to know or identify your footing as a round footing. If you put a 1 in there, it will identify your footing as a square footing. Row 10 requires input of an ultimate bearing capacity value. Before I'll move on, just note there... If uh, there always is a note column, typically to the right of the yellow cell, that does give you a few pointers on entering information. Okay, the ultimate bearing capacity value. This is the ultimate bearing capacity table, and it is located immediately below the table we were just looking at, the bearing strength assessment table. The ultimate bearing capacity table itself is comprised of eight subtables. At least that's what we're going to call them for this presentation. Uh, in your user manual, it doesn't call them subtables. Uh, each of these eight subtables is for a specific combination of soil type and ultimate bearing capacity calculation method. The first two subtables, which are shown here, utilize the general bearing capacity equation. The top uh, table for saturated clays and the bottom one for cohesionless soils for sands and, uh, and gravels. The next subtable uh, requires data from a standard penetration test, which is called the STP test, and the next two subtables require data from the cone penetration test, the CPT. The last three subtables require data obtained from a pressure meter test and here they are I don't think there's a lot of people that actually use the pressure meter test to determine soil properties but there certainly are a few 
So for our example uh, problem, we're going to use the second of the eight subtables. So I brought that slide back up. And the second is the subtable associated with the general bearing capacity equation for cohesionless soils. The only input value required in this case is the drain soil friction angle for the soil located below the footing. The value in this case was 35 degrees, and it produced an ultimate bearing capacity, as you can see there, of 251.5 pounds per square inch. The 251.5 uh, value is entered on row 10 of the bearing strength assessment table. Row 11 and 12 of the table require the LRFD resistance factor for bearing strength assessment and the ASD safety factor for bearing strength assessment, uh, respectively. These two values are obtained from this table, which is from the ASAB standard and is located in the worksheet immediately to the right of the bearing capacity assessment table. I know it's difficult to see, but there are two sets of LRFD resistance factors and two sets of ASD safety factors, normal risk and low risk. Use low risk factors for buildings and other structures that require a low risk to human life in the event of a failure. Low risk LRFD resistance factors are 25% greater than the normal risk LRFD resistance factors. Low risk ASD safety factors are 20% less than normal risk ASD safety factors. Resistance and safety factors for cohesionless soils for your sands and gravels are a function of drained soil friction angle. By entering the appropriate soil friction angle in the table's only yellow box, way up there on the top row, or it's actually row three in the, in the spreadsheet, uh, and column N, uh, when you enter the soil friction angle in there, the soil friction angle related adjustments are automatically performed. I just point out that the LRFD resistance factor is always equal to 1.4 divided by the ASD safety factor. For reasons that are discussed in the ASABE paper that you have in front of you, an ASD safety factor of 2.67 was entered in row 12 of the bearing strength assessment table, and an LRFD resistance factor of 0.53 was entered in row 11 of the table. With these entries, all yellow cells have been filled, and the red cell on line 23 lets you know if your design requirements are met. In this case, yes means the design is satisfactory, that the soil is not overloaded under the applied bearing load. The fifth worksheet is the Lateral Strength Assessment-U worksheet. The U stands for Universal Method and refers to the method in the standard that utilizes a series of soil springs to model the lateral stiffness and resisting strength of the soil surrounding the foundation. The universal method is a powerful method of analysis, okay? Since the soil surrounding the foundation does not need to be uniform for the entire depth of the foundation, this means it does not have to be a one soil type with fixed properties for the entire depth of the foundation. And the method is applicable to foundations with or without attached footings and or collars, and it's applicable to foundations backfilled with concrete or a controlled uh, low strength material. In addition to obviously, um, being applicable to foundations with any other type of backfill. It's just that the uh, concrete and low, controlled low strength material will increase the lateral strength of that foundation system. There are five tables and one plot in the worksheet. Only two of the five tables are of importance to the user. These are the lateral strength assessment universal method table, part of which is shown here, and the table that contains the resistance and safety factors. Inputting data to this table is very straightforward. It begins with input of foundation dimensions. This includes depth and width of the pier or post without any attached footing or collar. You can watch me as I go down the left side of the screen here. Then you have a section for entering data on, a, the, uh, on any attached footing 
and be clear here, this is an attached footing. If your footing is detached, you're going to be entering zero values in in rows 8, 9, and 10 or 11. I guess 10 and 11 represent the same entry there. Attached collar. If you have an attached collar, you need to enter the depth to the top, the depth to the bottom, and the width of that attached collar. If you have concrete or controlled low strength material backfill, you need to enter the depth to the top of that backfill, the depth to the bottom of that backfill, and the width of that backfill. There's um, three items to note here. Okay, again, when a particular component is not present, you got to enter a zero in the worksheet for each of the components dimensions and I and again the second thing here is that there's no place to enter dimensions for detached footing since a footing that is detached from a pure post uh, it supports does not increase the lateral strength uh, capacity of the foundation so just be clear don't confuse attached with detached only enter data for attached footings third for all components width refers to the horizontal dimension of the component face that is pushing on the soil. And this means that component width can change if there's a change in the direction in which the foundation is, is loaded. It also should, I should also point out that the far right column, again, contains notes to guide user input. This is the second part of the same table. All that is required here are the applied ground line shear force and ground line bending moment and the corresponding resistance and safety factors. We're going to come back to that slide, but first we want to look at some sign convention. When entering shear and bending moment values, sign convention, at least the sign convention shown here, must be used. As a rule of thumb, the force is positive if, when acting independently, it rotates the foundation in a clockwise direction. If a post or pier is restrained at grade, the ground line bending moment and the ground line shear force that are input to the worksheet are the bending moment and shear force in the post just below the ground surface restraint. Just below a ground surface restraint, the bending moment and the shear will have opposite signs in accordance with these sign conventions. If you um, have an LRFD loading, you'll need a resistance factor for lateral strength assessment. And if you have an ASD loading, you will need a safety factor from lateral strength assessment. These values come from this table, which is located to the immediate right of the lateral strength assessment uh, dash universal method table. And again, this table, like the similar one uh, for bearing strength assessment, come directly from the ASAB standard, as actually noted in the title of this particular table. For our example analysis, and now we're back uh, filling in the values in that lateral strength assessment dash um, universal method um, table. Um, what well we we selected here a low risk ASD safety factor of 2.38, and that's entered in a row 24 as you see there. And along with our loads that we arrived at via a a structural analysis and in this case we're using allowable stress design so all the values associated with allowable stress design are non-zero and all those associated with load and resistance factor design are zero values in this case when everything was said and done um, if you look at the bottom row row 39 it tells you that our design requirements were met, that indeed this foundation is adequate, which means specifically that the soil surrounding the foundation uh, can handle the loads that are being applied to it. The worksheet also contains this plot, which also shows that the soil can handle the applied loads. This is a plot of ground line bending moment versus ground line shear. This plot contains what is referred to as the ultimate ground line bending moment versus the ultimate ground line shear force failure envelope, okay, along with a blue diamond and a red diamond. So that failure envelope is that banana-shaped curve.
curve, and we're going to keep um, from here on in. I'm just going to call it the failure envelope. If the red diamond is within the failure envelope, then the soil can handle the forces applied to the foundation by the structural loads. The blue diamond lies right on the failure envelope and also on a line that runs through both the origin and the red diamond. Coordinates for the blue diamond on the plot are the values listed in rows 38 and 37 of the previous table. Within the worksheet, the distance between the origin and the red diamond is compared to the distance between the origin and the blue diamond to determine if the foundation is adequately sized. There are three tables in this spreadsheet that I have not yet discussed and I will not discuss. Suffice it to say that they are required to produce this plot. What is important to point out is that the failure envelope that appears in this plot is solely a function of the foundation dimensions that you enter into the lateral strength assessment universal table and the soil information that you enter into the soil profile worksheet. Now, Given that the soil profile for a particular site is generally fixed, the only way to expand the failure envelope is to increase the width and or depth of one or more of your foundation components. And it's kind of fun to change numbers in a table above this plot and watch the size of this particular failure envelope change. Move in or out depending upon uh, whether or not you're increasing or decreasing the size of a foundation element. Here's another fair failure envelope taken from a figure appearing in the current ASAB standard. I've included it to show that every point on the failure envelope is associated with a unique location of the ultimate pivot point, which is the location below grade at which the foundation does not move laterally when the ultimate resisting capacity of the soil has been reached. At this point, I think I'll back up a bit and make sure everyone is clear on what is taking place. I use the phrase ultimate resisting capacity of the soil. The ultimate resisting capacity of the soil is the point at which all soil in contact with the foundation has failed. As you keep increasing the ground line shear or the ground line bending moment or both, at some point soil will start to yield. You continue increasing those ground line forces and at some point all the soil will have yielded. When all the soil has yielded, there will be a single point below grade above which the foundation is pushing the soil in one direction and below which the foundation is pushing the soil in the opposite direction and all that soil has yielded. This point is the ultimate pivot point. As this plot shows you, the location of this point depends on the combination of the ground line bending moment and ground line shear when the ultimate resisting capacity of the soil is reached. On this plot, the depth of the ultimate pivot point is identified as D sub R U and is shown as a function of the total foundation depth D sub F. For example, Okay, the very top box reads DRU equal to 0 0.25 DF, which means the distance to the ultimate pivot point is at 1 eighth of the total foundation depth. When DRU is equal to 0, the ultimate pivot point is at the surface, which is the case when you have a ground surface restraint. The red squares identify the two points on the failure envelope where DRU is equal to zero. These are the two extreme points, way upper left, way lower right. The upper left point is for clockwise foundation rotation, the lower right for counterclockwise foundation rotation. And whether something is in a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation is dictated by the color of the boxes. Green for clockwise foundation rotation, yellow for counterclockwise foundation rotation. One thing I want to make sure is clear. The location of the red diamond on this plot is dictated by the loads applied to the foundation at grade and the associated resistance or safety factors. When you have a foundation that is not constrained from moving laterally at grade, 
we call that a non-constrained foundation, the ground line bending moment and ground line shear typically have the same sign. They're either both positive or they're both negative in accordance with our sign convention. This means that for non-constrained foundations, the red diamond is almost always located in the red triangular regions shown here. Think about that. That is a very restricted region of this ultimate failure envelope, a very small portion of that ultimate failure envelope. And you know what that's telling you? It's saying that if you want to get the most out of a foundation system, you need to restrain that foundation at grade. It is surprising, if you start crunching numbers here, how much smaller a surface restrained foundation can be relative to one that is not constrained near grade. The sixth worksheet is the Lateral Strength Assessment S worksheet. The S stands for Simplified Method and refers to the method in the standard that uses simple algebraic equations to determine the maximum ultimate ground line bending moment that can be applied to a foundation before the lateral resisting capacity of the soil is exceeded. There are two major restrictions for use of the simplified method. First, the soil is assumed to be homogeneous for the entire embedment depth. And second, the width of the foundation must be constant. This last requirement generally means that there are no attached collars or footings that are effective in resisting lateral soil forces. There are two additional requirements for use of the simplified method and they apply to non-constrained foundations. These requirements are first, the ground line shear force and ground line bending moment must have the same sign as we've previously defined them. And as I noted uh, in discussions of the previous slides, typically for non-constrained foundations, those two values typically are the same sign. They're either both positive or negative. And then second, in soils with cohesion, depth to the ultimate pivot point below grade must be greater than four times the face width of the poster pier foundation. And that is something that the spreadsheet will actually help you identify. There are two tables in this worksheet. This is a screenshot of the first part of the main table. The other table in this worksheet contains appropriate resistance and safety factors. There are only 13 yellow cells in this worksheet and they are all shown here. The simplified method was developed for three different soil types cohesionless, cohesive, and mixed. For a cohesionless soil, a non-zero value, or non-zero values, I should say, are entered into the worksheet for drain soil friction angle and moist unit weight of the soil. And zero values are input for soil cohesion and undrained soil shear strength. If you have a cohesive soil, a non-zero value is entered into the worksheet for undrained soil shear strength, and zero values are input for soil friction angle, moist unit weight of the soil, and soil cohesion. A mixed soil is considered to be a drained sand or gravel with a measurable amount of soil cohesion. Required input properties for a mixed soil include drain soil friction angle, moist unit weight, and soil cohesion, with a zero value entered into the worksheet for undrained soil shear strength. So that takes you all the way down to row 15, where a zero is entered if the foundation is not restrained from horizontal movement at grade, or a one is entered for the special condition where the foundation is restrained at grain. And we now know how significant that can be. Applied load and resistance safety and safety factors are entered on rows 16 through 20. You are either using ASD or LFD related loads, which Every one you use, you enter zero values for the others. For this example, an ASD loading was used. So all the values associated with an LRFD loading were set to zero. And that includes the LRFD resistance factor for lateral strength assessment in row 21. Resistance and safety factors for lateral strength assessment using a simplified method are from this table, which is located in the worksheet just to the right of the table we just saw. And again, it is directly taken from the ASAB standard. It happens to be table four in the standard. Here is the lower half of the lateral strength assessment simplified method table. 
I'm not going to go over all the rows here. The paper explains their purpose. We'll just focus on the last row, which indicates whether the soil is overloaded from a design perspective. In this case, the no in the red box means the soil surrounding the foundation is overloaded by the ground line shear force and bending moment acting on the foundation. This typically means you're going to have to increase either the width or depth of your post, add restraint, reduce your safety factor, or so forth. The uplift strength assessment worksheet is the last of the seven worksheets and is used to determine the extent that soil surrounding the foundation can resist uplift forces applied to the foundation. In accordance with the standard, adhesion and hence friction between a foundation and soil is ignored in uplift calculations. While foundation to soil adhesion can significantly increase uplift resistance, it is highly dependent upon soil type and moisture content, and thus it's not a reliable component of uplift resistance. When foundation to soil adhesion is ignored, the only resistance to uplift force is provided by uh, a straight pier or post foundation with a uniform cross section is the dead weight of the foundation itself. It follows that to have any measurable resistance to uplift forces, a foundation must have an enlarged space and or attachments near the base that bear against the soil as the foundation is pulled upward. Collectively, an enlarged foundation base and or attachments near the base are referred to as an uplift resisting system. The uplift strength assessment worksheet contains four tables. The main table is called the uplift strength assessment table and the first part of it is shown here. There are 11 yellow cells in the table. The first two entries define the horizontal dimensions of the uplift resisting system. For a round uplift resisting system, enter the diameter on row 5 and enter a zero on row six. For a rectangular uplift resisting system, enter the length of the shorter side on row five and the length of the longer side on row six. For a square uplift resisting system, row five and six will have identical entries. Do not neglect to enter a zero on row six for a round uplift resisting system as that zero triggers a worksheet to treat the uplift resisting system as a round system. The distance between the soil surface and the top of the uplift resisting system is entered on row 7. The cross-sectional area of that portion of the foundation located above, uh, above the uplift resisting system is entered on row 8. Um, for a, a post that would be manufactured from three nominal 2 by 6 inch members, AP would be equal to 4.5 times 5.5 inches or 24.8 square inches. And that's actually what I've used here for this example. Uh, on row 9, you enter the total mass of the foundation components that would be pulled out of the ground should the soil surrounding the foundation fail. This would not include the mass of a detached footing. To help users calculate this value, this table, called the Foundation Mass Estimator Table, was included in the worksheet. Right below this table is the this example of its use. For lack of time, I'm not going to explain how to use this table. Well, that's covered in the paper. I will say it, that it has some pretty slick features and just maybe point out one of those. So we've got a concrete collar that is being used perhaps to provide our uplift resistance and that collar is cast around a wood post in this particular case. Well, to calculate out the mass of that collar, I've treated it first of all as a solid cylinder and that is the weight that you see uh, provided on line two, the 265.1 pounds. But I have to subtract out of that solid cylinder of concrete the portion that's taken up by the wood post that it has been cast around. And to do that, I just simply put a minus sign in here for the density of the concrete collar and then I put in here for the area, the area of the post that's going through that collar. And that would be a 12-inch depth of the post because the concrete collar itself is 12 inches thick. 
And then we got the size of the post, 4.5 by 5.5 inches. So I subtract out uh, 25.8 pounds. So little things like that. And you can add in hardware uh, and other miscellaneous things as well. And on the bottom of the table, you're given some very nominal values for the density of concrete steel, high density polyethylene plastic, and wood. So back to the main table. You enter your foundation mass in row 9 and then move on to soil properties. In this case, soil located above the uplift resisting system must be assumed to be either a cohesion list, that means it's predominantly sand or, and or gravel, or cohesive, so predominantly silt or clay. For a cohesion list soil, enter the drained soil friction angle in row 10 and enter a zero in row 11. For a cohesive soil, enter the drained soil excuse me, enter the undrained soil shear strength in row 11 and enter zero in row 10. Where multiple soil types are located above the uplift resisting system, select the soil type and property that produces the lowest ultimate uplift resistance U as displayed on row 24 of the table, which we'll see in a minute. The axial uplift force applied to the foundation at grade is entered on row 12 for LRFD loadings and on row 13 for ASD loadings. Make sure to enter a zero on row 12 for an ASD loading or on row 13 for an LRFD loading. On row 14 and 15, you need to enter the appropriate safety factors. They come from this table, which is similar to the other tables that you have now seen. And this one happens to be table five out of the ASABE standard. With everything now entered in the top of the uplift strength assessment table, we move to the bottom of the table and we look for the red cell. In this case, we have a yes appearing, which means that the soil can resist the uplift force that we have entered. That brings me to the end of our overview of the workbook. I'd point out that the paper that you received today, um, the workbook itself, the Excel workbook, along with the ASAB paper that I wrote on lateral strength and stiffness of post and pure foundations, they are currently on the NFBA website. This presentation will be added there as well, so you can go back and look at it if uh, there was something that wasn't clear or I went over a little bit too fast and you can slow it down. Um, the other thing I just want to remind you again is that the standard itself is available from the ASAB Technical Library. You can just Google ASAB and jump right to their technical library and get a copy of it there. And again, um, you would have to pay for that if you are not an ASAB member. With that, I'd open it up to any questions you would have. And uh, prior to that, I just want to thank you for your attendance uh, today. And if you do have questions in the future, um, don't hesitate to give me a call. I can certainly uh, answer those. And, and my office phone number, I'll give that, is 608-262-9546. 608-262-9546. That's me at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you.